The scripture readings we'll be looking at tonight are from the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. Reading the first 18 verses, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not the shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my God. My own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down in my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. The second scripture passage we're going to look at tonight is from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at the fourth verse and going through verse 16. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer a spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him shall not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race a royal priest, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds, and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governor sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants. First Peter, chapter 2, verses 4 through 16. And one final verse, same chapter, verse 25. For you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Will you join me in word of prayer? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. There are two passages out of that in particular that are going to engage us tonight. Both from 1 Peter chapter 2. First from verse 5. You yourselves like living stones are being built up to be a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then verse 25, the last one we read, last verse of that chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2. 
For you were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. These two verses are in the same chapter of the same epistle, written by the same person, but have very different concepts. In the one, we are stones, we're rocks. And in the other, we're like sheep, and Jesus is our shepherd. So if you put the two together, you get this sort of comical-ish uh, image of shepherding rocks. And, and Americans should know something about that. In fact, maybe you even bought into it in the past. And if you're old enough, you've been around long enough, or you've lived in Spokane, Washington long enough, then perhaps you even know the person who introduced that idea to the United States to begin with. See, because he was reared in Spokane, Washington, and went to Washington State University before it was called Washington State University. And, and then he struck it rich in the 1970s, became famous, and he was on The Tonight Show, and he headlined articles in Newsweek and People magazines. This was in the mid-1970s when he made his fortune by getting everybody to buy into his craze. His name was Gary Dahl. And the fad that he got people excited about was called the Pet Rock. <laughs> yeah, do you remember it? Pet Rocks. <laughs> it was just a worthless piece of beach stone. But it came in a box kind of like a Happy Meal box today with the handles on it, except it had holes around the top so the pet rock could breathe. And then inside, it wasn't just the rock, but it was sitting on a bed of wood slivers, and it had an instruction manual in there. And the instruction manual said things like, well, if you take your pet rock out of its box and it gets excited, just set it on a piece of old newsprint. It will know what the newsprint is for, no further instruction necessary. And that was part of the genius of the pet rock, because as it debuted for that... Christmas season, 1975, it sold 1.5 million rocks in just three months. And why? Because in the self-indulgent time of the mid-1970s, people didn't want a pet they had to care for. They loved the idea of having a pet they didn't have to do anything for. They were tired of walking and feeding and grooming and tending their pets. And this pet, you didn't have to do anything. What a fun thing to have. And actually, that was the genesis of the idea to begin with. Because Gary Dahl, who came up with the idea, was bemoaning to his friends about his frustrations, about the constant care the pets need. Wouldn't it be great if we had a pet you didn't have to care for? And born was the idea for the pet rock. A few investors, and several months later, took the market by storm. I'm sure glad that Jesus apparently does not feel that way about us, because the scriptures do call us rocks. I mean, this passage, 1 Peter chapter 2, says that we're stones, and Jesus is the shepherd. But every image of the shepherd in, in all of the scriptures, every image of the shepherd describing his character and his relationship to us is an image that's saturated with concepts of sacrificial concern. Saturated with concepts of sacrificial concern. Just think about this passage. Probably the quintessential shepherd passage in the scriptures is Psalm 23. And there it says that the shepherd leads us beside quiet waters. He's the one who takes us to green pastures. He's the one who protects us in the valley of the shadow of death. He's the one who even restores our very life. And they go a little further in the Old Testament. You get to Ezekiel chapter 34. And the shepherd is the one who protects his sheep from all of the false shepherds. Shepherds who are out just to fleece the sheep instead of caring for the sheep, and are ready to butcher the sheep instead of feeding the sheep, he protects us from those false shepherds, which, in the context of Ezekiel 34, uh, this is the greedy for gain leaders of Israel. And that's similar to what Jesus was talking about in the lesson I read in John chapter 10, because he's talking about a sheep pen and those who climb in, not through the door, but climb in another way, and they're thieves and they're robbers. Because if they were shepherds, they would come through the door. But they come in another way because these aren't their sheep. Their sheep aren't in this pen, but they want those sheep, but they come in to steal them. And there he's talking about false shepherds who are the false teachers who would lead Jesus' people away from his voice and away from him. But it doesn't have to be false shepherds doing that because Isaiah chapter 53 says that the sheep do that on their own as well. Isaiah 53 said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And that's why in the New Testament, Luke chapter 15, the shepherd needs to be constantly seeking. And our shepherd is always seeking after the 
those wandering sheep who have gotten themselves lost. And probably the paramount passage of pastoral care of all the shepherding images in Scripture is in John chapter 10. We read it tonight, but it's a little further down, verses 11 through 14, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. The hired hand, who does not own the sheep, cares nothing for the sheep. When he sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and flees because he does not own the sheep. And he has no concern for the sheep. And so the wolf snatches them, scatters them. But I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. See, that is a sacrificial image of a shepherd. It's a shepherd who puts his own life to the wolf instead of the sheep. And in that case, the wolf is Satan. And he's got twin jaws of sin and death that are grabbing the sheep. But Jesus takes it for us puts himself in the way of the wolf. Now, you can't sell that. You can't market that image. You can't turn that into a get-rich-quick scheme because nobody's going to buy that craze. People think it's just crazy. Why would you put that much effort, that much sacrifice into sheep or rocks? Because that's what Scripture says we are. The rocks are just stones. But Jesus has. He cares about it. And, and he's our shepherd. And he's got a lot of pet rocks. He's got a whole church full of pet rocks. You should call him uh, the rock shepherd. But Jesus' pet rocks aren't ones you can just set on some old newsprint and let them be. Because Jesus' pet rocks have a unique feature. Did you hear it? First Peter chapter 2. Jesus' pet rocks are living stones. Living stones because we've been bought by the shepherd who is able to give life. And he proved it there in John chapter 10 when he said that he gave his life for the sheep, but he gave it up of his own accord. No one takes it from him, but he has the authority to lay down and the authority to take it up again. And because he can, he can give life to those stones that come to him as well. Now that's worth something. You could have bought this in 1975, a pet rock for $3.95, which in today's dollars, I, I did the math, it's about $18. $18 for a silly rock that's worth nothing. <laughs> but what about us? What are we worth? Well, Jesus. First Peter chapter 1, the chapter before this, says we're worth more than gold and silver combined. We're worth the precious blood of the shepherd himself. We've been brought to Jesus as living stones being built up, as sheep who were wandering, straying, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Now, I'm focusing on these two passages tonight. One, because this is the fourth Sunday after Easter. And for churches that follow the church here and the cycle of it, like our church does, the fourth Sunday after Easter is the Sunday to focus on God as our shepherd our Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. It's Good Shepherd Sunday. So the readings every year are some variation on readings about Jesus as the shepherd. And so they are this year as well. So we have that Good Shepherd theme. But we're also embarking here at Holy Cross on a theme of living stones throughout this May. There are four Sundays in May. Each Sunday, we're going to be looking at the same epistle lesson from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 16. And we're going to mine it for what it says about us being living stones. Because several years ago, about six years ago, we began that theme here at Holy Cross for our expanding ministries and expanding facility. And we've talked about it being living stones. And we, we said that it was a living stones expansion because God was building us up in we want to look back. It's a great time to look back now after four years and see what has God done through that expansion of our facility and how has God shepherded us and kept us and nurtured us and grown us in that time. Now, many of you have been around for some of those ministries. You were around for a Bible day camp where you sent kids or neighbors or nephews or grandkids to it in the summertime. Maybe you were around for some of our fall ministries like our campership auction or you were there for a mystery dinner theater that we had last fall. Perhaps you were there this spring for our spring family night with bouncy houses and castles and other things and lots of people from the community. Or maybe you just participate on Sunday morning. So I want to tell you about some things, two things that I, I know nobody in this room was there for. 
What happened last Friday? This is a homeschool group in Spokane who's finishing out their homeschool year, about 80 to 100 people, families. Families who are interested in teaching their kids academics, but more than that, and grounding them in faithful living at the same time. They were looking for a place to finish out their homeschool year with a potluck celebration. A couple of those families worship here at Holy Cross, and so they used our facility as that opportunity to gather together and encourage one another in what they're doing. And, and not only did they do that just a week ago as they finished out the year, but the place they had been meeting last year is not available anymore. They're looking for someplace else. And one of our families volunteered to be the host. We might be partnering with them, having them in here every week next year. Then let me tell you also about 35 teenagers who were here on Wednesday night dancing and singing in their final rehearsal for our debut of the musical Footloose at University High School. That was last week. And they were rehearsing here through CYT. These are teenagers who are participating in a musical that is all about how teenagers took the lead in helping a community overcome fear and grief and begin to experience love and trust again. And these are Christian teenagers who are interested in growing up into Christian leaders like that themselves. Christian leaders who will be the next generation of Christian leaders for the Church of Christ. Not just here at Holy Cross, but the Church of Christ broadly speaking in our community. And, and so Offering them this partnership and space to where they can be here is just one small way that we continue to support Christian youth theater and what it's doing to raise up that next generation of Christian leaders for our community. See, that's why we call this campaign to expand our facility Living Stones to begin with. Because as we prayerfully debated what we were going to build between the years of 2005 and 2011, and I say prayerfully debated, and sometimes there was more prayer, and other times there was a lot more debate. But as we were doing that, we realized that this really isn't about the building. It's about the people who are going to come and who are going to use that space, who are going to be brought to Christ as wayward sheep straying, who are being brought back to the shepherd and overseer of their souls. That rocks who are going to become living stones. And I wonder if you know what happened. I wonder if you know what happened to Gary Dahl's pet rock pet in the 1970s. It wasn't long before it was over. Just a few months. Even though he tried to add other products and accessories you could get for your pet rocks, it didn't last very long because it seems that having a pet rock that you don't have to do anything or does it create any lasting connection between people and their pets? And the same thing is true for the facility that we built. The facility itself is not going to do anything to create a lasting connection between the community unless we sacrificially love and care for the people who are using it. Sacrificially caring for the people who are using it because pet rocks are for the self-indulgent. But shepherding living stones is for the sacrificial at heart. Let me say that again. Pet rocks are for the self-indulgent. But shepherding living stones is for the sacrificial at heart. And that's what and that's who Jesus calls us to be. As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, you yourselves, Peter says, as living stones are being built up to be a spiritual house, often spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now those sacrifices talked about in 1 Peter 2 verse 5 are not some archaic form of Old Testament worship. Those sacrifices are our participation in the sacrificial shepherding ministry of Jesus. It's our participation in the sacrificial shepherding ministry of Jesus. Peter talks about that in this epistle. If we keep going to chapter 4, he's going to say this in verse 8 of chapter 4. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. For love covers over multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each of you has received a gift, use it to serve the other as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks, speak as with the oracles of God. Whoever serves, as the one serving with the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 8 through 11. That is not easy to do. It's not easy. It takes energy to pour into somebody else like that. It takes courage to step out and be a Christian leader. 
It takes concern and compassion to reorient our priorities and make someone else's priority ours. But this is the kind of thing that I've seen happen among living stones. Here at Holy Cross, we saw it happen this morning. This is the time of year where our middle schoolers are sharing their faith and some faith essays. And two of those middle schoolers prepared their faith in an essay that they shared right here in front of the whole congregation this morning. That takes energy. That takes courage to stand up in front of everybody else and speak their faith. And as Peter said here, whoever speaks, let him speak as with the oracles of God. What they spoke, even though it was in their own words about what they believed and what they've been learning in confirmation class in the last two years, what they spoke was not just their words, they were speaking as those who speak the oracles of God because this is the faith that God has wrought in their hearts. And so it also makes me think of 217 people in our new facility sitting down to Easter breakfast of fresh fruits and fresh French toast and fresh baked goods from Petite Shop Bakery. And it smelled so good, but that wasn't what made it incredible. And it wasn't the videos that were playing, showing pictures. It wasn't the decor of the room. And it wasn't that it was filled and people uh, lined up outside waiting to get in. What made it incredible was the spiritual sacrifice of dozens of volunteers who gave up their Easter Sunday celebrations to make that happen, and the few who for days and weeks leading up to it have been coordinating it, and all those who brought food and donated it so that others could eat it. That was the spiritual sacrifice. So, the thing with that kind of spiritual sacrifice, though, tell you this, the thing with that sacrifice is that when you are offering that to others, oftentimes the people who are receiving it, they are just rocks. <laughs> I mean, they have no idea the effort and the energy. They have no idea the sacrifice that you've poured into this, that you're doing for them. And just like rocks, they just sit there and receive it with no appreciation at all. stewards of God's very grace. And we serve not our own strength, but with the strength that he supplies. And we give freely of that grace to others around us. That's what turns that rocks into living it turns pet rocks into living stones as people experience the grace of the living one, Jesus Christ. And experiencing that grace, it transforms them itself through Jesus. And as you come to him, the living stones, rejected by man but chosen by God and precious to him, you yourselves like living stones are being to be a spiritual house, to be a holy priest, and to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. More about that next week.